Hello everyone, my name is Evan Freiberger and today we're going to be covering the tropics and also the United States. We have a couple of tropical waves out here. This one right here actually looks a little bit more organized than it was yesterday. It's forecasted to come up in this direction with now a 90% chance over the next seven days of development with a two day chance of 50%. And we've got another tropical wave back over here. Seems a little bit further south than it was yesterday. It was expected to track somewhat like this. This tropical wave has a 60% chance of developing over the next seven days and a 20% over the next two days. We also have major hurricane Gabrielle out here in the Atlantic as well. And as you can see, she has strengthened to a category four hurricane with 140 mile per hour winds and 165 mile per hour wind gusts, meaning that we are officially at the peak of Gabrielle, but thankfully Gabrielle's going to be a fish storm all the way until it gets <laughs> over here where it'll probably be a subtropical storm, but could bring some impacts to Spain. And then back over in the United States, we are still watching this ejection of cooler air and wind aloft to eventually push into parts of Oklahoma, Missouri, Arkansas coming into Tennessee, and then tomorrow back up over uh, in this direction, bringing thunderstorms and the chances for severe weather all the way up into this region, into the southeast. And if you zoom all the way in and check out this little area right here, near the cities of like and subscribe, you can see that we do have an approaching complex of thunderstorms that we will be also forecasting today. Could bring some tornado chances back over into Arkansas and parts of Oklahoma. So we'll be breaking all of that down in extreme detail for you guys today. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's a little low pressure system coming into parts of Kansas, Oklahoma right now. There are some showers and thunderstorms associated on the eastern side of this. And if we come over to our upper level wind, all the way up into the 300 millibar, you can see where our trough is and where the spreading apart of our wind vectors. These little flat looking things, you can see this one's facing up to like the northeast. These ones are facing more down to the southeast. That's where a lot of our forcing is going to be. And most of our strongest storms are going to be along that boundary. Coming over to our 500 millibar winds, you can see that they're generally moving from west to northeast, meaning that we do have some pretty decent winds aloft of around 45 knots. Not the strongest. And honestly, with this kind of wind at this height, it's a little bit on the weaker side, but still strong enough to support some severe weather. And then coming all the way down to the surface, you can also see in our 850 millibar range, do have some winds pushing up in to Oklahoma. And that's eventually going to be pushing up into parts of Missouri and Arkansas, and that's where our tornado threat today is going to arise from. So I think across the board, this is pretty much the pattern that we are going to be dealing with. But we can look at other models to see what they are saying. This is the Euro model. You can see that it's kind of on the same page. GDPS as well, GFS as well, HRRR, HWRF. HWRF V3 is a little bit more bullish on that lower level wind, so got to keep an eye out for that scenario. But generally, most of the models are saying the same thing. We're going to have that trough eject. We're going to have some lower level winds and some spinning at the surface, which means that there will be enough rotation for a tornado threat. But believe it or not, that's not all you need. Another thing that you need is a lot of moisture in the atmosphere and heating from the sun. And you can see out there, we are going to have upwards to 70 degree dew points as this trough ejects into our area. If you look at our other models, you can see that some of our models aren't as bullish with this moisture, but almost all of the models pretty much agree on those 70 degree dew points, except for a select few, which we're going to consider outliers for now. Now, all of this moisture that's going to be locked into this area is going to be getting hit by the sun, and that's going to make it more buoyant. When you mix the moisture and that buoyancy together, you get CAPE or convective available potential energy. If you have anything above a thousand joules per kilogram, that's going to be enough to support some severe weather. And as you can see, about a thousand to two thousand joules per kilogram, that's going to be pulling up into this area throughout the day. But let's go push this a little bit closer to when our storm will be at its worst. And yeah, check this out. You can see as this storm really starts to eject that instability is going to continue to build those dew points mixed with that heat from the sun is going to start to make this air really buoyant making it easier to rise and easier for thunderstorms to fire and you can see we're going to be talking about anything from two to three thousand joules per kilogram which is around three times as much as you need to sustain severe weather so it looks like the, these storms are going to have no problem being severe we look at some of our other models you can see that there is a little bit of disagreement but generally above a thousand joules per kilogram is associated with every single one of these models. So all of our models are in agreement that there is going to be enough instability today. Now, another important thing to keep an eye on are the lapse rates. Typically, when these get below six, like it is over here in Missouri and Arkansas right now, it's harder for severe weather to fire. 
And as you can see, we're kind of getting a mixed message from a lot of our different models here as we move into when these storms are kind of forecasted to fire. You can see that a lot of our models or some of our models do indicate around six degree lapse rates over there into the northwestern portion of Arkansas. And I am not too bullish on that because of cloud cover. And neither is the RFS or the Rufus model. Yeah, there's little spotty areas, but only very small areas where our lapse rates will be above six degrees. And essentially, this means how strong our updrafts can be. So if our updrafts are too weak, storms might struggle to mature. And you really do need that maturity of the storm or the storms to be really tall, to be able to tap into that shear environment where that lower level winds and those 500 millibar winds are mixing. So this could be a problem for today's severe weather. We'll be talking about why in just a little bit. But the last thing I want to break down is our storm relative helicity. Now, this just indicates just how much the winds are turning with height. And as you can see, we are talking about anywhere from around 200 to maybe even upwards to 400 storm relative helicity around where our storms will be firing. And typically when you're above 150, that means you have a environment where weaker tornadoes are possible. And then when you're up towards like three to 400, you're talking about the potential for strong tornadoes if everything lines up just right. And looking at our other models, you can see that they're all all pretty much in agreement that a lot of storm relative helicity is going to be there. But one of the big caveats is where does our convection fire? So I want to come back out of the model comparator here for just a moment. And as I push this forward, you can see that over there into the northeastern quadrant of Arkansas, that's where our most of our thunderstorms are really wanting to fire by around 1 p.m. today, meaning that if you live up here in the northeastern corner of Arkansas, I would definitely be paying attention at this time. One of the things that immediately sticks out to me is how clustered these storms are. You can see that they're very close together, and that is going to be cause for concern, especially for the storm itself, not necessarily the people under it, because too many storms in one area means that they have to battle for those ingredients that we were just talking about and there's not enough to go around for everybody so if they're all clustered together it also makes them a little bit more susceptible to outflow which is essentially just cool air pushing out in front of it remember we need that warm moist air any cool air that surges out in front of the storm kind of like feeding anchovies to a baby that baby ain't gonna eat no anchovies and neither will the storm so outflow not good for storms and the more clustered these storms are the more susceptible they are to those anchovies or outflow that's gonna be one of the fail modes as well really just depends on if our lapse rates are there at this time as these could be weak updrafts as well but generally given the storm relative helicity that could be in this area pretty volatile spin environment meaning that these storms could get going and go for a little bit i mean starting off at around 1 p.m over there in northeastern arkansas and then extending into central arkansas and eventually we're going to see some thunderstorms extend all the way back into texas but again these won't really be tornadic our main tornadic activity is going to be up here into the arkansas area by this time by the time we get into around 7 p.m today you can see this is more of a line segment meaning we're probably going to be mainly dealing with some damaging winds at that point as these push down to the south and east but definitely something to keep an eye on let's come back over to a little bit easier to see of a view here you can see right there probably around Fayetteville and Springdale's when these things are gonna get started near around 1 p.m. by 3 we're gonna have more storms south of Fayetteville near Fort Smith and Russellville by 7 p.m. this is gonna be dropping down towards like Conway Hot Springs Village uh, over there into the southeastern corner of Oklahoma could see some severe weather down there and then eventually this is you see how this is just mainly a big line and a big cluster of storms still could be a small tornado threat at this time but it is at around 10 p.m. where we're really gonna see that tornado threat drop off of a cliff as that instability starts to wane that day daylight heating starts to wane but still some thunderstorms could be possible going all the way into 3 a.m now if we come over here and look at our more simple graphics here you can see that we do have a slight risk out here for Tulsa Taliqua Fort Smith Hot Springs Conway Jonesboro over there near McKinney as well we have a marginal risk extending all the way from Lubbock into Nashville so not super elevated in terms of like super large hail or like super strong damaging winds but there will definitely be some strong storms in this area one of the things that I think could be the most deadliest impact of this storm will be the tornado threat it's not super elevated but we do have a five percent chance for tornadoes out over here near claremore muskogee stigler taliqua fort smith fayetteville springdale bella vista russellville conway and then around that, we have a 2% for tornadoes. Also, a little bit of a marginal risk over here near Roanoke, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Trenton, and Harrisburg. No tornado threat up there. It's mainly going to be for wind, no hail. And if we come over to our future radar, you can see that's mainly going to happen at around 4 to 5 p.m. as we get a little bit of a shortwave trough, bring some little bit of instability, some cooler air mixed with some warmer air is going to be enough instability to kind of push these storms into Baltimore and Washington with some severe potential, but mainly just going to be damaging winds. 
Now, if we go over into, into tomorrow's risk, we have an area, pretty large marginal risk, all the way from San Antonio going up into Jackson, Birmingham, Huntsville, Nashville, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Charleston. As of right now, there's no tornado threat. Damaging winds are going to be the primary threat here, a 5% chance for some damaging winds. And the main reason why that is, at least for now, it does appear that our trough is really going to lose its organization going into tomorrow. There could be a cluster of thunderstorms that develops in southeastern Arkansas, going into Louisiana and Houston, could see some scattered thunderstorms maybe some of those could be severe and then by the time we get into around the late night hours talking at around from 4 to about 1 a.m could have some thunderstorms and maybe even a couple instances of severe weather over here near chattanooga harriman the reason why this isn't much worse than what it is if we come over here to our 850 millibar winds you can see that there's just not many it's de definitely been downgraded more and more as we get closer and closer to this storm our ejecting trough is all the way back over here so it's not even really pushing into the area where we do have some elevated uh lower level winds so it's just kind of a missed timing of a lot of these storms there is going to be enough instability to go around for really everybody that has a storm nearby them so you definitely got to keep an eye uh, for some damaging winds but that's going to be about it for tomorrow unless we see these models significantly change into tomorrow but we'll be keeping an eye on it if there is a change we'll let you know now, out over in the atlantic we are still monitoring these tropical waves right now and kind of the main story with these two guys which we're going to be going over in our forecast here in just a little bit is whether or not one of these storms becomes dominant we got this one over here and this one over here as of right now the tropical wave that's a little bit further away from us has probably a little bit of a better chance of making a turn to the north but still some uncertainty does exist there most of our models are hinting at this storm right here having a better chance to develop but there is no reason for these storms to be able to be like a tropical storm at the same time so gotta keep an eye out for that especially with this storm taking a little bit more of a southerly track further south that goes the higher chances this will have to make impacts somewhere in the United States. And given how close these storms are going to be, I do want to preface this forecast by saying like, hey, this could be one of those really hard to forecast ones for either one of these storms, because depending on how strong either one of them are, and then you throw in the larger scale atmospheric veritability, it is possible that it's going to be kind of really hard to track these storms. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right. So look at the tropics. You can see that uh, here's the GFS model. We do have one wave right here and another wave back over here. Here. high pressure system out over in the central atlantic which is helping steer gabrielle away from us and towards spain at that low pressure over here in the united states as well looking at our humidity out there you can see that there is a decent amount of moisture out in front of our storms as you could tell but believe it or not this big old push of cooler air that's going to be coming into the united states is going to allow for at the very least if our wave that is further away which i think is what the gfs is indicating here is the one that takes dominance see it will likely interact with the trough that's going to be bringing the severe weather into the united states and kind of push it out to sea and away from us there is plenty of moisture for this storm to try to develop but with this storm kind of ejecting a little bit further to the south than some of our models have been saying if you push this back you can see that trough has been slowly drifting a little bit further and further to the south and the more it does that the more it's going to kind of affect the development of our storm now if we go over to the euro model it is still split you can see it also shows a decent amount of moisture maybe a little bit more dry air out there than the gfs also shows this low pressure trying to develop down here a little bit further to the south does show both of our storms trying to develop into some sort of tropical system and maybe even the potential for both of them to be tropical storms at the same time this one is going to be getting that sheer kind of a lot there and kind of die off maybe even kind of pull into North Carolina again as a subtropical storm kind of like what we had last week and then the euro says that our storm out over in the ocean has a little bit of a better chance uh, to develop now if we come over to our sheer environment you can see that this low pressure system our first wave that comes close to the United States it's going to be getting ripped apart by some sheer and dry air at the same time as we just saw that's going to really hurt this storm but this storm back over here it in just for a brief moment stays in a less of a sheer environment and even strengthens pretty significantly before another trough kind of dives down and lifts our storm away from us so still more indications that the strongest storm that will form out here in the Atlantic will become a fish storm but if you compare this to the GFS the reason why this storm struggles more on the GFS than the euro is because the wind shear that this storm produces at least on this model is a little bit more broad and that impacts our storm for longer kind of keeping it less powerful until it's starts to interact with that second trough and maybe becomes more of a subtropical system afterwards. So a lot of moving parts in this forecast. 
But a little interesting thing to note here from the Euro AI model is that it actually brings this low pressure system way further than the south than both of our models. You can see it, it's over there near Cuba trying to develop while this storm a little bit further to the east takes the track that we would generally think it would. But look at this because these storms kind of interact at just the right time and the Euro model brings our trough a lot quicker off to the north and east and then sinks a high pressure system down at just the right time. It actually brings that more eastern wave into the Carolinas as potentially a strong tropical storm or maybe even a weak hurricane. Again, still not super confident on the AI models. You know, if we go back and see its different solutions over the past couple of days, you can see it was bringing this thing out as a fish storm pretty consistently. And then now all of a sudden it's saying, hey, oh, now I think it's going to be a United States impact. And it's differing again from our global models. So, you know, we're still about 180 hours out from this wave making impacts to the United States. So I'm still not like completely completely convinced in any of these scenarios just yet, but it does seem like we're either going to get a close approach or maybe even some land impacts. So bottom line is, is that, yeah, we do have to keep an eye on both of these guys. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about Gabriel and only time will tell, but we'll let you know when the new information comes out on these guys, especially if it's looking like we have a higher chance of United States impacts. Now, a lot of you guys might be wondering what might be coming after this new trough happens in the United States as it slowly ejects then pushes off to the east that's going to bring a lot of dry air in the country, which means after this trough moves through, we should have a period here at least for some quiet weather and some cooler temperatures. And as I continue to push this forward, you can see that generally not really seeing many big systems. We're going to have this low pressure system potentially hang out for a little while, maybe some increased severe weather in the plains as we get to the 30th. And then as we go into the beginning of October, you can see that there's just really not much of anything until we get into about maybe the beginning of October. Could see some troughs try to eject into the upper plains but man I, if we come over here to the surface base cape and see instability up there in october that would be pretty weird yeah there's no instability up there so that's pretty normal a little bit there as we go into the third but again this is pretty far out Generally, it looks like it is going to be relatively quiet. There could be some smaller scale severe weather, though, into the central plains if there's enough instability. But again, instability is going to be battling to come back in as there's going to be a lot of dry air out there. Now, in terms of temperatures, the highs for today's, you can see that down into the southeast, still 80s and 90s. You see that little cold pool of air brought down by that trough is still sneaking in to a lot of the United States today. Going to be relatively cool and stormy out there for a lot of folks. And as I continue to push this forward, you can see that cooler air still is forecasted to really push down here into the southeast, into Texas, widespread 70s and 60s and 80s, really not many places you know, above 90 degrees, except for in the southeast, south Texas, and also into the Pacific Southwest. And as I continue to push this forward, you can see that that cool air kind of sticks around until about the 25th, where we're going to be seeing a warm up again, also into the 26th as well. You can see 80s, maybe even 90s, making it all the way up into Minnesota, which is definitely a normally hot up there and then warming back up into the 60s and 70s and maybe low 80s the further off to the east you go pushing this forward a little bit further you can see that because we don't have any major troughs come in and there's going to be kind of a high pressure system dominating this area it's going to stay relatively warm for a lot of folks so really not really seeing much changes to our forecast happening in a while you know until we get a bigger trough come in they're just going to continue to see this heat stick around for a long time potentially even getting up close to the 100 degree temperatures in October in South Dakota, folks, that's not normal. And please don't try to convince yourself it is. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be it for me, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you guys on the next video. Peace.